Hey everybody, it's Musk with our Fates Voyage Onward 4.9 patch month in review. And so I'm looking to start doing these uh, month in review videos after each of the Rune Terra opens. It feels like a nice little uh, break point between the start of Fates Voyage Onward and then with the Rune Terra open uh, really coming in and wrapping up the month. And so, you know, the release of Volibear, Janna, uh, and Nyla, exciting stuff. I really enjoyed playing this format. This was a season that. Uh, we made our first voyage uh, into the top 10 of the ladder. Uh, didn't have as much success in the Runeterra Open as I really would have liked to have done, but I uh, had a great time playing with this expansion, uh, and we'd love to talk about it a little bit more. And so, uh, right at the beginning of the season, it was quite interesting. The servers just kind of crapped out <laughs> for the first few days. There, there's no real way, no real reason to tell uh, why or what had happened. I like to just envision that it was because the, the champions in the set were so wildly popular uh, that Riot wasn't really uh, expecting the load that came upon them. And, you know, that's the way it usually happens uh, across all of these games as a new set is released. Uh, I can think back to my times of playing Hearthstone and what a drag it was to where uh, you would buy like 200 some packs. You have to sit there and individually open every single one. You have to compete with the servers going down. While you sit there and click, 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 click through everything. And then it took you like a couple of hours of just nonsense before you even got to jump in and play the games. But, you know, it was a uh, release day. Everyone was still excited. And that's what uh, what you kind of hoped uh, and dreamed was to be uh, a part of that excitement. And so uh, is that what happened here? Was it uh, the, the servers were just overloaded with excitement or something else? I, I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, in my brain canon. Uh, the Nyla Janna Volibear set was so wildly successful uh, that it brought the servers down. But, you know, Riot was pretty forthcoming and clear on getting it fixed. I thought that was pretty exciting. And, and I feel like the community reaction to this set uh, was just completely massive, uh, especially compared to the last set that uh, fell kind of flat. People weren't particularly excited about Nico and Friends. And uh, I think that the set release here was much more uh, interesting and wild. I do remember seeing... Uh, so some notes on Twitter from Vivo. Uh, he runs the, the runeterra.ar site uh, about his site just getting completely maxed out uh, with the impending release of uh, a Fates Voyage onward. And so even if it didn't uh, cause the Riot servers to go down, it certainly caused uh, some issues in a good way to some other people throughout the community. Uh, but in terms of the game itself, I feel like we got super lucky with this patch. Whenever it comes to evaluating new cards, uh, there's a, a few different things that I like to really look at. And so is a card just straight up stat efficient, right? So if we look at a card like Blocking Badger Bear, a 4-4 for 3 mana is extremely efficient. If we look at the big boogeyman of the current format and Warden of the Tribes getting 70-some stats for 8 mana, very efficient. But the other thing I like to really look at is, uh, do these cards let me break the rules of the game? And so do I get to gain additional mana? Do I get to draw additional cards? Do I get to make my cards cheaper? Like the, you know, the set form of what you're allowed to do within the game, how do these cards let me break those rules? And Janna in the Updraft Kit does a tremendous job of just breaking all of the rules of the game. And so when Janna flips, she gets to draw extra cards. The Updraft, updraft mechanic makes all of your card draws cheaper. And then you have these cards like Windborn Mariner, which gets to come down for free. And the Exalted Cloudwinder, which does both sets of rule breaking again in terms of coming down both cheaper and coming down and drawing cards. And so uh, I was ultimately pretty worried uh, about how obnoxious this kit was going to be. And I really kind of fully expected that we were going to run into another season like we saw when Samira was first released as to where uh, every single deck you play uh, while not being the exact same deck, does have Samira in it. <laughs> and so you'd say, here's my Samira Freylord deck, here's my S Samira Sharima deck, here's my Samira PNZ deck, here's my Samira Bilgewater deck. Uh, all the way across the board, it was just all Samira all the time. And I was really expecting this set uh, to have the same problem with Janna, uh, and it didn't come about. Uh, that was thankfully in part to the Warden of the Tribes, uh, but I think as we kind of push forward into the balance patch and into the next sets, I'm really hoping uh, that we're going to see some tuning in terms of Janna and the Windborn Mariner and friends. I'll say that me personally, uh, as far as uh, the deck building kind of goes, I, f I was really trying to get myself into this spot to where we could come into the Rune Ter Terra open and bring three Windborn Mariner decks. And we got really close. Uh, the 
Uh, of course, Nyla Janna was the top deck of the format, uh, but after that, we were playing the champion strength Janna deck, which was extremely powerful and I think was actually the uh, sleeper deck of the format. Uh, but then I was also getting very close uh, in terms of having decks involving rummages and being a very strong P and Z Noxus style of aggro deck. Didn't quite come together. These weren't things that play very well in a format full of Omenhawk, but uh, I think this was really right on the edge of exploding. And I have a bit of worry going into the balance patch and especially going into the uh, eternal season that these cards need to be kind of toned down a little bit i ultimately worry quite a bit uh, about a format with twisted fate and draven in it along with all of these janna cards <laughs> and no changes being made to janna and so we'll we'll see i i feel like uh these weren't super oppressive as they could have been i ultimately had a ton of fun with this format but i think when it ultimately comes down to it Whatever these new cards are released, I think it's fine and fair for them to be overtuned a little bit, right? And so it just falls flat on everyone if the new set comes out and then the new cards just don't get played and we're basically just playing the same meta all over again with like one new card from the new set. And so I think it's fair to have the set come out. Janna's overtuned, Nyla's overtuned, Bully Bear's overturned, everyone is playing with the new cards. And then as long when we get into the balance patch, they get kind of tuned down just a little bit uh, back into a space of, of feeling good. And so I think we got lucky with Janna in this set. Uh, I think that she needs to be uh, uh, upped in cost, not upped in cost, have her level up, up by one. And then I think she'll be in a fairly decent space. And then I think the Windborn Mariner uh, either needs to be a 2-1 if he's going to continue to cost zero, which I don't think is exciting, or I think he needs to cost three. And then uh, if you've drawn two cards, he costs two less, so he comes down for one mana. Uh, at the price of doing that, you could probably fairly safely make Windborn Mariner a 3-2 to mirror the Exalted Cloudwinder. But uh, throughout the course of the game, we've seen tons of problems with zero cost cards, and the Windborn Mariner should just not be costing zero at the price point he's getting here. And so I think those are the two big ones. I think that does uh, quite a bit of work in kind of reeling in the Janna kit especially for standard next season if we're going to see nerfs to warden of the tribes and for the eternal season upcoming i'm ultimately super worried about twisted fate but uh, i think that that will be kind of interesting but up next with that we've mentioned warden of the tribes quite a bit and i think that he brings up a very interesting space and so i personally i come from a history of magic i've talked about the bane slayer uh, Angel issue before, and uh, we're going to bring it up here again. And so if you're not familiar with Baneslayer Angel, we've got it on the screen here. It's a 5-5 five, five for 5 mana. It's got elusive, quick attack, life steal, uh, and then protection from a couple relevant keywords. So you could say doesn't take damage from raptors and dogs or some shit if that's what you need to kind of wrap your brain around. But uh, I forget who said it. It may have been Brian Kibler. It was probably someone else. But the idea was that if Baneslayer Angel was a good card, then that was probably a pretty healthy format. And so uh, the Baneslayer Angel really lends itself to being in a spot to where you're getting into a lot of uh, unit-centric and combat-centric games. And then the removal spells to take it out are probably kind of about the same price. And so you don't find yourself in a format to where... Uh, you're playing your Baneslayer Angel for five mana and it's just getting killed for two mana. And then it's also coming down and having an extreme amount of relevance. And so that, you know, takes me back to these metas to where, say, stuff like Seraphine Bar is extremely good. The metas to where Ezreal is extremely good. It's not to say that the game shouldn't have these, like, really ultimately powerful game ending effects, but you should ideally be able to interact with it in some way. And you shouldn't just be playing a game of solitaire uh, once that effect comes down and happens. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that Warden of the Tribes really kind of fits in that space to where, uh, is it overpowered? Yes, uh, you know, something de does need done to Warden of the Tribes in terms of tuning it down. But uh, I think it also does a couple of things, right? I think it really fits in that space of the, uh, the Baneslayer Angel issue is to where if we have a format to where Warden of the Tribes is extremely relevant, that's probably a format that involves a lot of unit interactivity and a lot of combat, right? The Warden of the Tribes does not 
uh, have a lot of success if he's coming down as an 11-11 unit but doesn't have any friends on the board. He's really trying to develop these boards to where you have four and five other units on the board. You get that massive collection of stats to really uh, make his uh, his investment worth the while. And so uh, I think that you know he's not really given enough credit in terms of the kind of game states that he develops. Now, I do agree that it is fairly obnoxious as to where you know, you just get to turn eight and you play your warden and win the game. Uh, you know, the, the games don't really devolve down to that easily. I, I know there's a large portion of the pro community that aren't particularly happy with the warden of the tribe uh, kind of meta. I know deep down they understand that there's more to the meta than just playing warden of the tribes on eight and having the game end. But uh, if you're one of those people that really wants to have that uh, super grindy chess match of a game to where you're playing Ionia, <laughs> then you're probably not as enthralled with Warden of the Tribes as the other people. But I personally think this style of game is much better than those kind of karma, let's play solitaire style of matches. It, it really kind of draws me back uh, to some of the metas to where these things I'm about to mention were overpowered, right? Things like uh, Turbo Thralls were quite overpowered, but it was a unit-based game ender that you had the opportunity to interact with. And the same thing kind of applies with, say, the Winding Light uh, before it was nerfed to not having overwhelm to where, yes, it was overpowered. Yes, it just, uh, you know, felt like it developed a lot of oops, I win style of boards, but those boards were all very unit centric. And then you did still have the option to be like playing cards like the Ruination. You had options to play cards like Castigate. Things like Harsh Winds could stop portions of it. Uh, I had a lot of success in this current format with looking to use the Explorer Quicksand thing to take Quicksand off of the Warden of the Tribes. So if opponent didn't have other Overwhelm units, they potentially couldn't kill you on the turn. And so while these all aren't great answers to Warden of the Tribes, these are answers to Warden of the Tribes to where, you know, if your opponent's just comboing off with Back Alley Bar, that game was probably done like three turns ago, but you still have to sit around and wait on the Solitaire. And so uh, I, I personally think that this format was a, uh, a Bane Slayer Angel format, and I liked, uh, I, I liked how it played out quite a bit. But... Moving on with Warden of the Tribes, I think this is the big problem with both Warden of the Tribes and also Glacial Saurion, is they are just tied into a subtype, and I don't think that that's really within the kind of zoo flavor that things are, are trying to push themselves towards. And so I've seen a lot of kind of discussion and context in terms of how do we rein in Warden of the Tribes? Do we... Uh, kick him back up to nine mana? Do we take away his overwhelm? Do we reduce his base stats? And I don't think that that really fixes the problem. And it especially doesn't fix the problem with Glacial Saurion, which I think is the actual uh, main offender of problems in the format, which is they are all just tied into subtype. And, you know, I, I think that the subtype theme is kind of interesting in terms of uh, assembling the zoo of units, right? You get all of Nico's forest friends together. If you're playing that deck building restriction of only having these specific subtypes within your deck, then you should have some kind of big reward for it at the end of the game. And that's what, you know, Warden of the Tribes is really intent and meant on be to be doing, right? You have your Nikos, you have your birds, your cats, your dogs, your Elnix, your Fays, your Reptiles, your Spiders. That's, you know, kind of a limited selection of, of subtypes that you got within your, within your deck there. But the way that it actually turned out within the constructed meta is everybody's playing Innovative Blacksmith because that's the best subtype unit in the game. And then you're finding other cutesy ways to get subtypes within your deck, right? Most of these decks played uh, Nar as a Yordle. You had things like Jarvan and blocking Badger Bear as elites. You would see things like Renekton come in as an Ascended Reptile. Uh, you have Forsaken Bakai here as a Cultist. These aren't thematically as to what the ability is trying to do, right? These are just cards that kind of incidentally have subtypes for other reasons, but they're applying that bonus to Warden of the Tribes uh, to make his effect come in and operate. And so, you know, I, I think the kind of fix for this is they, they make a, a new keyword like, I don't know, zookeeper, jungle friends, animal bro, like whatever you need to do to, to really kind of indicate that this is the kind of collection of forest animals that get the bonus. And then you start tying that keyword into things like Glacial Saurion, and then you tie it into Warden of the Tribes. And so you would still be able to play Innovative Blacksmith within your Warden of the Tribes deck. You could play Combat Cook in your Warden of the Tribes deck, but the Weapon Master keyword isn't going to tie itself back 
to that big bonus that it delivers. And so I think that that really kind of thematically tries to hammer home uh, what this kind of subtype thing is supposed to be doing is to where the Nico kit has her kind of, you know, animal-based friends. She has the deck building restriction of having these animal-based friends within it. But if you want to take full advantage of something like Warden of the Tribes or take full advantage of Glacial Saurion, you actually have to do some work uh, in terms of your deck building to make that pay off. As it stands right now, you don't have to do any work. You just play a bunch of cards that you already wanted to play anyways. And now, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of suffering for it in terms of Warden of the Tribes and Glacial Saurion. And so, you know, it's probably too much text to, to go back and just say, all right, specifically Glacial Saurion, you get to deal with these specific um, uh, subtypes, but uh, I think that that is the actual ultimate fix to this thing. Do I think that's realistically what's going to happen? Do I think Riot is going to come out in the balance patch and be like, whoa, everybody, we got a new keyword, and we're going to retroactively apply this to things like Nico? No, I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, uh, if they take their kind of intermediary fix to Warden of the Tribes to where they just take Overwhelm off of it, and then, uh, you know, three or four months down the road, we get that kind of keyword thing applied to it. I think that that works, you know, a little bit more successfully. It's kind of like adding uh, Titanic as a, uh, a keyword to the game. Yes, you can put if this unit has eight attack or eight power or eight health, whatever, at a certain point of the game, then it does something. But it's much easier to say if you have a Titanic unit, I, I think that's the space you really want to be in with these cards is if you have a, a if you have a zoo unit, right, or whatever, uh, then that kind of thing applies to it. But uh, continuing on with the, this kind of theme of Warden of the Tribes, I think the next big question that brings is Riot Lock still relevant. And so uh, what you, if you're not familiar with the formats of best of three, the way that it currently works is it's called Riot Lock. And so you can only play a champion within a single deck. So you cannot have two separate decks that contain Janna and you can only use a faction combination once. And so you can have a Frey Lord Demacia deck and then you could have a Frey Lord P and Z deck, and then you could have a Frey Lord and Noxus deck. And so you're able to play uh, the same uh, the same faction over and over and over again, or the same region, I should say, over and over and over again. But uh, you just can't duplicate on champions, and you can't duplicate on the pairs of the regions. And so what that really lends itself to is finding a non-champion card, and then just completely building around that across the entirety of your lineup. And so uh, within this current season, we just saw it done with Warden of the Tribes. I really tried my hardest to do it with the uh, the drawn cards P and Z kit. Wasn't quite able to get there. I was ultimately super surprised in the previous season that we didn't have a tri triple cosmic call meta. Uh, running through Eternal. It sounds like it probably happened in Standard, but, but who was actually playing Standard? And, and while I don't think that that is a bad thing, right? Uh, my kind of thought on the on the matter is you have one very good version of the deck, right? And so uh, in this past season uh, with the Warden of the Tribes, the Warden of the Tribes NAR deck was just the actual best one. And then if you want to bring a second version, say you're bringing the Sharima version, it's a little bit weaker, right? It doesn't have uh, the good Demacia units. You decided to put NAR in a different deck. So your NAR deck might be tier one. This one might be tier one and a half. And then a little bit further down the road, you have like your Nico deck, right? And that one is probably just tier two. And so while you would have the option within best of three to bring the kind of same deck over and over and over again, your opponent has the choice to just ban out your best one. If you kind of put all of your eggs in one basket in terms of that Demacia version with NAR, or you have the, the possibility to say, put NAR in the worst deck, right? So maybe you look to play uh, a different keyworded, you know, Frey Lord champion within your Demacia deck because the Demacia cards are so good and you kind of equal out the power level of all your decks. Like, I think these are all very, you know, interesting and relevant things in terms of best of three. But at the end of the day, to me, if you say what really separates Legends of Runeterra from all of the other games and what really is the kind of highlight, the high point of Legends of Runeterra, 
to me, that is the champions. And so I think it's a, a real shame and a real disaster when you run into these formats that are just completely highlighted by a single unit uh, because the focus uh, should be on the champions. And then that also ties doubly back into the game League of Legends, right? The, the, the parent game, the OG, if you will, in terms of both all of the champions in the game are derived from League of Legends. And then also at the start of every League of Legends game, there is the pick and ban phase to where you are assembling your team of champions, picking yours, banning out the ones from the opponents. The, the draft is uh, an essential part of every single game. And so I think that there's, you know, that very nice throwback within Runeterra as to where uh, when we're playing best of three, we have that pick and ban phase of the meta as to where, uh, you know, we're designing our lineup with these certain champions in mind. We're planning on banning out another champion, expecting opponents to ban our champion and the like. And it has that real nice flow and feel to it. And then it also has that nice throwback to League of Legends. And I feel just like Riot Lock really kind of gets us away from that feeling. It really, you know, uh, doesn't hammer home the idea that the champions are the, the kind of forefront of the picture. And so why I bring this up is I understand it in the early times, right? The way that the, the sets in the game was released is we had five factions right at the start. Then we had the Rising Tides, that was the Bilgewater set. Then we had the uh, Call of the Mountain, that was the Mount Targon set. Then we had... Uh, Rise of the Ascended, Empire of the Ascended, whatever that was called. That was the Shirima set. And then we had the Hey Bandle City set. And then we had the, the final one of the kind of mixture, uh, the... Uh uh, the world ender that started adding in the rune terran champions and so if you wanted to go back to 2020 to where we're playing a competitive event that's foundations plus the uh, the rising tides you can't set your game up like that to where uh your your region locked right if you want to say you can have one bilgewater deck then you're just like limited in everything else right you have to say okay you have one bilgewater deck one pnz deck one Freylord lord deck one demacia deck like that really limits what you were able to do in terms of deck building and it just didn't make sense back then you couldn't really region lock anything but now that we are you know two years three years further down the line the uh, factions are all fleshed out we have the introduction of the rune terran champions it, it seems to me like it should be safe to at least experiment with moving to a different format that should ideally force the champions to the forefront. And so whether or not that is uh, switching from riot lock to region lock or doing a thing to where you can't play more than three copies of a card across all of your decks so that you wouldn't be able to play nine Warden of the Tribes in your lineups. There's, you know, a few different things that I would love to see uh, introduced throughout the gauntlet that would kind of push the game more towards being a champion centric game and not just being the best card in the format centric game and so you know that's my idea my feel i feel like warden of the tribes really drove that home it would be kind of nice if you had the option to just ban the warden of the tribes deck away uh, during the deck building phase and that's what you get uh, as you move away from Riot Lock. And so again, I, I'm not saying, okay, let's just go ahead and swap everything out for the next season, right? We have Gauntlet out here. I think that uh, Gauntlet should be a fantastic place to, to go ahead and try this. Make it so you don't have to play free build all the time, <laughs> right? You can uh, try out the new things there and see how it goes. And so speaking of the Gauntlets, this is a place to where I am a big supporter of the Gauntlet. Uh, I, I feel like it's you know a very fantastic way uh, to push people into the competitive scene, but the the gauntlets right now are, are kind of fucked in terms of rewards, right? Riot, uh, you know, makes the game very free to play friendly, which really comes in and hampers uh, what you're able to kind of deliver in terms of rewards. And so we'll cycle back to that con comment here in a little bit. But as it stands right now, from a purely competitive scene, this is a very rough season, right? So the the prime glory. Like, uh, the way that it always goes for me is the season starts, I don't want to play uh, Gauntlet because the ladder is just where it's at, right? You get to go and experiment, you get to try and be the, the first one to hit Masters, and you're just going back and forth with these new things. You can edit your deck quickly, you can really have fun with the deck building, and when I'm in this, like, mindset of, 
okay, I've got this new brew I want to try. I'm going to play a game. I'm going to swap three or four cards out. I'm going to play another game. I'm going to swap three or four cards out. I'm going to play four games, and then I'm going to, you know, edit my champion numbers and stuff. There's a lot of very fun iteration that happens during deck building that you just can't do in a gauntlet, right? If you jump into a gauntlet, you have to play like six or eight games before you get that opportunity to come in and edit your deck around and have fun with that. So at the beginning of the season, I just never play gauntlets. And then, you know, the Ruthless Rumbles roll around and then you're like, oh, okay, so I have to grind this thing really hard, right? I really want to get these trophies to, to get my way up to uh, that prime glory, right? And then as you're looking at it, you're like, holy fuck, that prime glory is super far away. And so if you don't ultimately have a very successful Ruthless Rumble season, uh, that is a, a very tough mountain to climb. And I'll, I'll tell you, like I play this game. It's not a brag. Like I, I'm sure I just play this game way too much. But uh, as someone that plays the game way too much, I would see that distance marker to the prime glory and just be like, nope. That's that's like way out of line. That's way, way too far ahead. And so when, when someone such as myself that does play this game an absurd amount says, you know, that target is so far away, I don't even want to bother chasing it. Like the general community just has to be like, nope, that's uh, <laughs> that's way out of line with what I'm trying to do. But as I, you know, kind of continued this mountain to grind, I was having a lot of fun, right? This has been a very fun format. I don't want to come off as though I'm bitching about the state of the game. This has been a very wonderful meta, but uh, the, the gauntlet rewards are all messed up in the sense that uh, last season, you could just join a gauntlet and quit and do that to infinity so you didn't actually have to play gauntlets to unlock the Prime Glories. They fixed that, so now you have to actually get a win uh, to unlock a Prime Glory, which is kind of messed up in the sense that uh, it, the one of the actual worst feelings now is jumping into one of these gauntlets and then going 0-2 and getting absolutely nothing for it. I think that there probably should be a trophy for, you know, going 0-2 in it. And then if you really want to take the time to jump into a gauntlet, queue twice, concede automatically, and then jump in again 200 times, then fine. You know, you got your buy, right? That's the way I kind of look at it. But that ultimately felt pretty bad. But the other angle to this was if you win a four-match gauntlet, you get... 10 trophies. If you win one match in a gauntlet, you get four. And so my channel followers know wholeheartedly and fully well that I'm not very good at math, but I did that one pretty quick, right? I get one win, I quit, I get four trophies. If I get four wins uh, all the way through the end of the gauntlet, I get 10. And so I'm only getting two and a half trophies for win. And so uh, the, the numbers need to be adjusted there just in the sense of uh, you know, if you want people to actually complete the event, then they need to be getting more trophies for it. But the other piece here was just like actually how long it was going to take to, to come out and get that prime glory. And so I'm pretty certain the mathematics I put here on the third line are pretty close to where you have to get 200 trophies for a prime glory. You get four prime glories for a win because we're just playing one match and quitting. Uh, so you have to get 50 wins, 50 match wins to get that prime glory. Then you're not going to win 100% of your game. So say you win 75%, which is pretty tough to do, uh, but it is quite doable for the, the upper echelon of player, especially since you will just randomly queue into like an iron two player on occasion. That should take you about 70 matches. And then if a game takes about eight minutes, and then you can either 2-0, that should take about 16 minutes, or uh, if you have to play the full three matches, then that would take about 24 minutes. So we're just going to call it 20 minutes a match. It should take you a literal 24 hours of game time under optimal circumstances to get to a singular buy. And that was just, you know, a bit absurd to me. Now, again, I did it. Uh, I told you I'm already, I'm, a, I'm kind of a degenerate and I was having fun doing it. So <laughs> it wasn't that bad for me, but for the general public uh, and for the general community scene, I, I think that that's a, a pretty terrible thing. Uh, last but not least, down at the very bottom right, I have a thing that says game win percentage is ooh. Uh, if you're not familiar with the kind of standard tiebreaker scene in a uh, Swiss style of event, the top tiebreaker is mat opponent match win percentage. And so uh, as you kind of continue through the event, 
if you start out one and zero, and then you win and you're two and zero, and you win and you're three and zero, and you win and you're four and zero, you should be playing against a progressively stronger collection of opponents that is also going to have a progressively higher match win rate. So uh, that person that you played at the second uh, second round. Uh, after you beat them, they're going to have a 50% match win rate, but if they continue winning, and that will climb back up. At the third round, when you beat that player, they now have a 66% match win rate percentage, but if they continue to win, that will continue to climb. And so uh, the, the way that that you know, would play out is if you lost in the first round, you're playing an opponent in the next round that also lost. Arguably, they may be a weaker player, but they have a 0% match win percentage. And then, so the idea is if the longer you continue that streak of just winning, um, you should be playing against more challenging opponents and you get more value. So the, the way that this really ties into buys in terms of a Swiss style of system is say that you have three buys. That was the big uh, starting point back in the Magic Grand Prix scene. Uh, you don't start playing the event until round four. And so your opponents have not lost any games up into that point. And so your match win percent opponent match win percentage is actually very huge, right? So as you played an opponent in the first round and they lost, their win match win percentage is very low. That's just completely re removed from the equation. Same with that second round and the third round uh, because you just never played anyone because you had the buys. Now, you, you can't do that with the system that we have in place for... Uh, the opens, right? With the opens, you aren't guaranteed to play against someone with the same record as you. Uh, I, I don't think it even has to be close. I think that you can be like 6-0 and oh in the event and play against someone with a 0-2 and two record. And so having match win percentage work there uh, makes a little bit of sense, but not entirely as much as it does in the Swiss system. And so uh, what Riot has done with these opens is the initial tiebreaker is your, your game win percentage. And so uh, if you, you know, say play out the event and go nine and zero in terms of matches, you're going to have 18 wins, but you might have picked up say five losses along the way. And so, if you went 18 and five, you're going to have higher tiebreakers than someone that went 18 and seven along the way. And so, uh, the the way that this is really just kind of going, I'm getting kind of long winded on this, is uh, with the game win percentage being the the main tiebreaker. The only thing that the buy gets you outside of that win is saying that you just did not lose one game in that match. And so the value that you get out of that win uh, is even lower in terms than it would be for an opponent match win percentage based system to where you just completely didn't have an opponent and that opponent's negativity is not factoring in. Uh, to your tiebreakers. And so it's just been, at the end of the day, the, the TLDR is this just kind of a massive pile of ooh. Uh, I, I'm glad that I grounded out. I felt like it was a very uh, worthwhile experience in terms of getting in tune with best of three. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I can't imagine anyone uh, feeling good about having to go through this. And so moving forward with more gauntlet conversation, the idea of Runeterra, while not being completely free to play, it is very uh, monetarily friendly, if you will, in terms of actually acquiring a collection. And so uh, I will say I try not to rant too hard about magic, but I hate so fucking much having to hear things like, Ooh, my collection is X dollars valuable, or this deck cost X dollars, or I opened a booster pack and it had negative EV. Like, just the financial slash monetary value of your magic collection is something that's just completely obnoxious to actually fucking hear. And I am so, 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 so glad that moving into the digital space with like Runeterra, that you don't have to listen to that nonsense anymore. And be like, oh, my, my deck is so valuable and all this like, oh, I fucking hated it so much. But with that aside, that is not to say that, you know, as the most popular deck gets more popular, that deck typically becomes more expensive to acquire, right? Uh, the supply and demand aspect of paper cards will drive up the price of the ones in the expensive deck. And if you had, say, $300 to spend on the current iteration of Standard, and you spent your $300 on uh, the blue, black, watery grave deck, and then two weeks later that deck is no good, now you're in a fucking bind, right? You either have to try and flip your blue, black, watery grave deck that's now not worth as much as it was when you initially spent on it, and you have to come up with the money to play something else. And so uh, you could very realistically and monetarily find yourself in a spot to where you can't play the deck in an event that you want to play, 
because it's not financially feasible. And so what that kind of ties into, though, is as you look to play in a magic event, the rewards from that event are, are quite, you know, monumental in the sense that if I buy into a $10 magic event and I get $80 of cards out of it, that uh, can be used to kind of subsidize the cost of trying to play the standard event. And so it does make playing tournament magic much more uh, interesting and exciting in the sense that the rewards that you get have a lot more actual value to what you're getting. That comes into the space of what we would call going infinite in the land of magic and that kind of extended to the land of arena and hearthstone is to where you're trying to just play the game for free right and so you buy into an event your winnings from that event fuel your ability to play in the next event and then you never actually have to spend money on the game by your success in those events now as we move over to the space with like legends of runeterra your your monetary like attachment to the game just does not exist right and so that makes it much more challenging to actually present reasonable rewards to come in and play an event like a gauntlet and so like there's a, a few just different problems in terms of the way that the gauntlet looks it's like i buy into an, a, a gauntlet i get into the 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 buy-in just completely irrelevant right so it's kind of like uh you know there's no harm there's no loss if i just jump into this thing and lose because the initial investment is nothing but on the flip side of that the rewards that you get back don't feel very compelling either both in what you actually get which is more of that useless monetary thing and then the way that it's also displayed to you there's no like flashy screen there's no congratulations you did it bust you bested the you bested the opponent so good here is your treasure chest of rewards right none of that stuff is here you just get like a pop-up window that says you got 10 trophies it doesn't even mention the gems or anything and then you're like supposed to be excited to queue into the next one like there is a very uh low like dopamine hit <laughs> if you will for uh, actually winning one of these gauntlets for me uh, uh, like the biggest thing that you would get would be like oh man i'm playing this this best of three match against the tank buster or mage and bay or whoever your um you know big player at the time is on your server shard and just like actually getting a strong match against that player and winning that was like much more rewardsome than anything you got ever in terms of rewards in this game and so like it, it didn't feel like i'm actually you know doing anything positive in terms of the game it was just like i had a good match against someone that was better than me and was able to take down victory and so uh what do i get for that uh you know <laughs> what do i get i i, I got into battle uh, with, with kawako and what did i get for besting the best uh you know <laughs> and so uh my answer to to kind of how do you make uh how do you make the the rewards feel more compelling has always been cosmetics right you can't give me any amount of shards that makes me want to actually come in and play gauntlet you have to either go towards cosmetics or you have to go towards some kind of leaderboard and now i suspect with a leaderboard there's just not enough people playing the thing to make it compelling right that's why the gauntlets have to be limited uh between like noon and 4 a.m or whatever it is so that you aren't in a spot to where you just sit in a queue for a half hour and so uh i, I don't know about the the viability of trying to do some leaderboard kind of thing but the, the cosmetics are where I feel like it would be uh, the most felt and influential. And so what I have on the screen here is the big pile of coins, right? Because that's what we're all sitting on in terms of, of shards. But uh, the variant idea that, that Magic has put forth and kind of generating artificial scarcity for the cards in the sense that uh, over to the left, we just have the standard watery grave from the normal set. The next one over is a retro frame watery grave. I, I don't know how you get it, but it's more rare. Over next to that, you have a masterpiece watery grave, which is much more rare to get. And then at the very end, you have some kind of extended art watery grave. And so in terms of like the free to play nature, having access to this leftmost watery grave, the most basic version of it, is enough to get you into the event, right? You should never be locked out of an event because you can't monetarily afford the cards. But if you do want to put in some effort, if you want to get some kind of reward for your doings or whatnot, uh, I think it's very nice that you have access to these other flavors of the cards. And that's the way I personally uh, would like to see Gauntlet go. Uh, picking up these things like pens is not particularly, you know, exciting or compelling to me. Like I I've never looked at someone and been like oh you got a pen like i don't i don't know what they even mean i i, I 
don't know which one I'm supposed to be impressed by, right? The, there's just, the, the pen system really falls kind of flat to me. Like, I, I think conceptually it, it makes sense, right? You've put a lot of work into Gauntlet, so you got this pen, but it, it just, it, it doesn't really like harmonize. It doesn't say, oh boy, you did so good at this because nobody knows what they means or care. And so uh, I feel like the kind of card-based cosmetics are the interesting one. Like it's been very nice for me since we top aided uh, uh, the, the last Eternal Open and getting the, the Pinnacle of Glory board and just having that, you know, big piece of flair. Like that's been pretty exciting to me. I, I didn't think that I would love having that so much, but it's really kind of grown on me as something that's been you know quite nice to have that uh, not everyone gets access to and that feels like something that would be nice uh, to get out of gauntlet and so uh, i know that last bit does really grind down on a lot of casuals as to where uh, you release something really cool and then they just don't have access to it but maybe that's the space where you can also take these uh i, I ground hard for style of rewards and then just put it in the emporium and now uh, everyone kind of have a, has access to it or something. Now, I, I don't know uh, if these answers are good answers. What I do know is that it does not feel good uh, playing uh, Gauntlet and getting rewards in its current state. And so our last screen, we're calling the Outsider's Point of View. One of the things that's really been coming up on Reddit and Twitter over the course of the past month is how do you get uh, someone that's invested in another card game to switch over to Runeterra? What do you tell them that's going to make them interested or excited uh, to come over and play the best card game in the world. And uh, that's something that really kind of hammers home to me. I've been trying to get my brother to switch from uh, Hearthstone to Runeterra for literal years. I've been trying to wear him down and get him away from the Lich King and over here uh, into the lands of Janna. And I've started to make some progress, but uh, it's been very tough to do. But as you see these threads on Reddit and threads on Twitter about how do you get someone to come over, probably like 90% of the responses that the best thing that someone can say about Runeterra is that it's free to play. You, you don't say it has this really interesting tie-in with League of Legends. You don't say the visuals are stunning. You don't say the resource system is fantastic. You don't say it has a very competitive PvP mode. You don't say that it has the probable best dungeon run game in the world, uh, something that is arguably as competitive as Slay the Spire. You don't say any of that stuff. You say it's free. And it's like, that's just completely obnoxious to me, right? If you're like, hey, Bust, you want to have some fun this weekend? Yep. What are we doing? And you're like, oh, we're going to get dinner and we're going to go to a concert. Cool. That sounds fun to me. And so if we flip that coin over and you say, hey, Bust, you want to have some fun this weekend? Yep. What are we going to do? Eh, it's free. Like that, that just stops the entire conversation, right? You didn't say anything that was going to be fun. You didn't describe anything that we were going to do. You just presented me with the monetary cost of this hypothetical thing that you might get to later. And so it's really kind of like a bummer that the best thing that people can actually come up with to talk about Legends of Runeterra is that it's free to play. And one of the more kind of like compelling introductions I've seen to the game here was from Rara. And this came out uh, a day ago, two days ago, once this video was released. And it was kind of interesting to me on multiple fronts in the sense that uh, he really kind of like walks through the game and not in terms of, oh, it's free to play, it's cheap, but in terms of, you know, the, the visuals and the gameplay and what you might like about this compared to Magic or what you might like about this compared to uh, Hearthstone. And I think he hits on like a lot of really interesting and high points along the way that don't just involve him going, oh, it's free to play. Like I can find all kinds of free to play stuff to do. That does not like really drive me to the game. Uh, I need to know something about the game and what's going to be happening with it. You know, if the visuals are going to be fun, if the gameplay is going to be great. Uh, and, and I think he touches on this in some very interesting in, uh, uh, ways and he presents it in a way that's much better than just going, uh, it's free to play. <laughs> and so uh, I did want to call out this video. I've got the link down in the description. If you've run into this kind of same problem before, as to where you want to describe Rune Terror to somebody, but you don't really know how to put the words together for it, uh, I feel like it's a, a very uh, valuable video to share in terms of describing the game uh, in the way that another card gamer will understand. And so that's it. That is our look back on the 4.9 patch, our month in review. Agree or disagree with anything we said? I'd love to hear about it, love to know. Uh, you can let me know down in the comments along with how free to play this game is. And so that 
is going to do it for us today. So I hope everyone enjoyed the video. I hope you maybe learned a thing or two along the way and you had a good time watching. So this is Bustin' Lee. Thank you for being here.